with us as we worship this morning. Well, you can have a seat. 
Welcome to Monta Vista Chapel. My name is Ashley Mutchler. I am the children's pastor here, and I just wanted to welcome you here in person and online. We are so excited to have you join us today. And it's actually a really special day here at Monta Vista Chapel because it's our family dedication Sunday. And so we are super excited to have three families that we are going to be dedicating this Sunday. Um, and I just wanted to explain a little bit about family dedications. So family dedications is an opportunity for parents to declare publicly that they are choosing to raise their child to know Jesus, to follow his teachings, to obey his commands. And so this is a public declaration in front of you, the church, to partner along with them. And so I want to bring up our first family this morning, and it's the Aldrich family. So come on up, you guys. This is Alex and Betsy Aldrich. And today they are dedicating Magnus. I mean, if that isn't a great strong name, I don't know what is. And then uh, they're joined by big sister Scarlett here. Hi, Magnus. Can you tell me how old you are? Two. You're two. Oh, my goodness. You're such a big boy. I love it. And you look so handsome today. So I'm just going to ask you guys a couple questions. Actually, just one question that you have to affirm. Um, so is it your desire to raise Magnus to understand and experience a personal relationship with Jesus and to gracefully follow his model and teachings? Yes. yes. Awesome. And did you guys have any blessings or scripture that you wanted to read out? All right. Uh, from 2 Corinthians. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen. Awesome. I'm just going to have you guys step right over here. Our next family this morning is the Little family. So this is Kyle and Amanda Little, and they are blessing Colton this morning. And Colton's looking very sharp as well. Good morning. Hi, Colton. How are you? Good. Do you like seeing all these people out here? Yeah. Can you tell everybody how old you are? Five. You're five. And are you in kindergarten this year? You are. Where's, what school? Turlock Christian. At Turlock Christian, a kindergartner. That's awesome. So... Kyle and Amanda. Do you desire to raise Colton to understand and experience a personal relationship with Jesus and to gracefully follow his models and teachings? Yes. Did you have a blessing that you wanted to read? Yeah. Okay, no problem. <laughs> they emailed me. They emailed me. We came prepared. <laughs> Colton, God blessed you with... God blessed our lives when he gave us you. You're a treasure on loan from heaven above. You are God's and his alone. How could something so perfect be entrusted to us we may never understand? You are a reflection of God's love for us. He gave us you, and today we dedicate you back to him. We promise to teach you about God and to show you his love in all we do. Colton, may you know that you are loved and continue to show love to all. Be fruitful and hear Jesus' call, faithful to God and trusting him through trials that come your way. May you serve God and others with wisdom and grace. Be strong but gentle, showing great self-control. Make good decisions, always seeking God's face. May you know to God there is no one above you. We pray you always maintain your love of learning about all God's incredible creations. May you be healthy, happy, and whole. Live long and prosper with heaven as your goal. What a, amen. All right, and then we have the Woods family this morning dedicating Ruthie. Ruthie is probably one of the happiest babies I have ever met. Hi, Ruthie. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Yeah. This is Maddie and Davis Woods and little Ruthie. So Maddie and Davis, 
Do you desire to raise Ruthie to understand and experience a personal relationship with Jesus and to gracefully follow his model and, and teachings? Awesome. And do you guys have a blessing or a verse you want to read? Yes. A little bit of both. <laughs> All right. We chose our blessing for Ruthie based on Proverbs 22.6, which reads, Train up your child in the way that he should go, and, he is, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Lord, help us to teach Ruthie to love you with all her heart. While the world gives her a false view of you and of love, let our home be a place where unconditional love is practiced and pursued. May Ruthie always remember your great love for her. May she know that she is never too far to return to you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to just have you guys take a stand right over there and have you guys come back here. Because not only is it the commission of parents to be the primary spiritual leaders of their family, it's also the church's responsibility to partner with them. You know, Moses was the first one in Deuteronomy 6 who declared that it takes a village to raise a child, and we firmly believe that here at Monta Vista Chapel. And so as the village, you all sitting here today, it is your wonderful joy that you get to partner with these families because you are their Sunday school teachers. You are their true cub leaders. You are their high school teachers. Heck, you could even maybe be a future in-law. Who knows, right? And so I'm just naming it and claiming it this morning. Um, so I just have a question for you as the congregation of Monta Vista Chapel. So is it your desire to help these families raise these children to follow the teachings and models of Jesus? If you, an enthusiastic yes. Yes, all right. Thank you. And so we just want to um, pray a blessing over these families. Uh, each of these parents just has been gifted with a special role to be the leaders of these children. And so if you could just extend a hand out as we um, just affirm and believe in the prayer today. Oh God, we thank you for Magnus and Colton and Ruthie. On this day, we dedicate these beloved children to you. We stand in a community of believers and before your throne, and we pray that they would know you are, they are loved deeply and unconditionally by their family and by you, O oh Lord. May these children grow to walk in paths of peace, run the race set out before them, and lie down in your green pastures when they are tired. We ask, Lord, that Magnus, Colton, and Ruthie grow in truth and righteousness and wisdom and in grace. May they dance with abandon and never be afraid to cry. May they be rooted in love and live with open hands and heart. We ask that you help Betsy and Alex, Amanda and Kyle, and Maddie and Davis to raise their children to choose peace over violence and empathy over judgment. We pray that you give these families the gift of community anchored in your love. May these children follow you and proclaim the miracle of who you are in all they create, in all that they say, and in all that they do. Thank you for the gift of these parents and the privilege of raising these children. We ask for you to help as they journey through life together. Guide them like a star in the sky. Illuminate the way so that they can parent with mercy and grace that comes from you and you alone. We could commit to partnering with these families and raising these children to know you as the living God. We know that in you, all are given life. You have created each of these children to love, and these families have committed to raising them in that love, surrounded by the body of Christ. Thank you for Magnus, Colton, and Ruthie. Thank you for their parents and extended family, and thank you for this church body. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, families. You guys can go have a seat. Will you please stand and worship with us this morning?
on your love. God, you are the foundation. You are the firm foundation that when everything is swirling around, the chaos of life and the culture, that you are the one who is at the eye of the storm. You're the one where the calm is. So God, I'm reminded of of David in, in Psalm 56 when he's being pursued by his enemies and they're talking about him and they're they're pushing on him and they're yeah, God, even though we're not being pursued by warlords, God, we are being pursued by all kinds of things. And what David said was, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid, what can man do to me? My God, I will present my offerings of thanks to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before you, God, in the light of life. And so, God, today we want to walk in the light of life with you. And so, Father, would you hear our hearts? Would you hear our prayers as we offer children for dedication? That, God, it's in you that these parents can raise these kids, and it's in you that this community can partner with them, and it's in you that we can find peace when everything is going. And so, Father, this is our offering, our lives built on your foundation. May it be so.
Uh, amen, amen. God, we acknowledge that today, that you reign, and sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we think we are the ones who are in control of our own little worlds, and we orient everything around that. And so as we come together to worship today, we are reminded again who owns the house, who is sovereign over life who is ultimately good and who knows what's best for us. So we turn our hearts and attention to you and we ask God that you would guide, that you would lead and that you would, as Chris said, receive our lives as offerings. Um, may they bring you praise. May we be a sweet aroma to you. God, we pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may be seated. Oh, it is so good to be together today. It's great to see everyone. Welcome. If you are visiting with us today, I just want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, one of the things that we do here at Monta Vista is we have a shared rhythm. And that shared rhythm includes gathering. That's what we're doing today. It includes giving of our finances. It includes um, uh, serving one another. And it includes going, like taking all the goodness that God has done and sharing it with others. And today, um, we have an opportunity to hear someone share about what it is to go into the world. So I'm going to invite Randy Fiorini up here, who's our guest. Now, this is uh, an example of like how I would love to continue to see the church um, go out into the world. Randy is um, a friend of mine, but he's also somebody who has had um, a, a lot of influence in the water world. Uh, that's in California and actually all over the nation, uh, developing water water policy. He has served three governors here in um, California about how to bring sustainable water into our state. And um, it's a passion of his. It always has been. And because of that, uh, Randy has kind of been listening to God as God has drawn him into a project in Ghana to bring a sustainable drinking water into some uh, places that desperately need it. And so Randy, would you come and share just a bit about your story? Ken, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Church, to share with you about um, experiences that I have had firsthand in the country of Ghana. The uh, first slide that will appear will show you a typical village in Ghana where half of the population in Ghana live. There's, uh, it's a country of about uh, 30 million people, half live in rural vi villages of approximately 500 to 600 people. Um, <laughs> the, um, I visited there seven years ago at the request of a Christian organization called Meaningful Life International. Their specific role in Ghana was to help provide clean drinking water in villages such as this. Next slide shows the primary water source of um, many of these villages. They're either polluted streams or mud holes that are dependent upon rainfall to scoop water out into 10 uh, buckets and carry uh, sometimes over a mile from the water source to the village for their drinking water. This water is polluted. It's filled with um, uh, things like guinea worm. I'm not going to describe that. You can, if you want to get grossed out, you can look that one up on Google. Mm. But uh, disease is prevalent. Many children die before the age of five because of waterborne diseases. So um, when I was there seven years ago, I was so moved. I wired home to my daughter, Stacy, our office manager, and had money sent to drill a well. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. The next slide shows the solution, the solution that Meaningful Life International is providing. Drilling wells in the middle of villages and providing a hand pump so that clean, fresh, disease-free drinking water can be made available. This picture was taken uh, about 10 days ago when I was in Ghana. We were drilling and we hit water and the celebration was, uh, people were ecstatic. The, the, the mission that I am leading is a fundraising campaign to raise a quarter of a million dollars to buy a rig just like this for Meaningful Life International so they can uh, control their schedule, they can provide uh, drinking wells and pumps, 
at a much lower cost than the commercial outfits that they're dependent upon to provide that service now. The next slide shows the anticipation. These kids were watching this well drilling operation. You see the bucket? That shows faith. That is great faith on their part that their lives are about to change. They have no idea. They have no idea the extent that this, this well and this pump are going to have on their lives to come. Schools will follow. Churches will follow. The opportunity to share Christ will follow in these villages because of that drinking water well. Here is, in the next picture, um, what um, a well looks like. This is the well that my family paid for. And uh, I got to visit Alafia Junction uh, just about a week ago. The lady in the picture is a former assemblywoman representing that region who has lived in this village for 70 years. And, um, well, let's go to the next slide. It's a video, and, and you can hear in her own words what a difference this well has made in their lives. So how helpful do you think this well has been over the oh, past five years? This water has helped a lot because mm -hmm. formerly when we were using river enswagement, shortly you see that we ran diarrhea and some other things. But when we started using this one as drinking water, for that sickness has stopped for a minute. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Amen. That's what I've noticed from this year. Amen. Did you do a medical outreach here? I think we did. So we came to so did again. you say there was sickness? Yes, from the old yes, source. From the old source, yeah. the dirty one. And then from, when you started having water here, sickness. the sickness left. Hmm. Thanks. So um, I have committed to underwrite all of the administrative costs in this fundraising effort. I have enlisted the help of the Elia family. Scott and Sharon, thank you for helping prepare all the promotional materials as we're just beginning the outreach to raise funds. Um, this is more than about providing a well. It's providing wellness for many, many villages that are in need in Ghana. I'll be at a table outside if anybody has uh, any questions or would like to learn more, and I've got a little handout that uh, the Elia Five have prepared. So, church, thank you for the opportunity. I uh, hope that many of you will want to share in prayer on this matter, and it's, um, it's extremely important. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you so much. Well, we now have the opportunity to go ahead and ask um, our children to stand. We get to dismiss them. Again, if you're visiting, we have the opportunity to say a blessing over them as they go to their classes through junior high today. So would you stand, children, and let's go ahead and say this blessing over them. May you know that your heavenly Father loves you. May you know that in Jesus you have been accepted into God's family. May you set your heart on things from above the things that matter most to God. Love, forgiveness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and kindness. God has chosen you and calls you his child. As you go, may you be rooted in his redeeming love. So go in God's grace. Thank you so much. It's just so great to see all the kids going. Ashley, it's awesome. Thanks for all of your help and all your volunteers' work. Yeah, yeah, that deserves some applause. So before we uh, head into the message, um, I do want to pause for a moment. We've had so much celebration today, and um, as it is in life, there's always mixed things going on, isn't there? And today is 9-11, and it is the memory of those who gave their lives, especially those first responders and those who died in the tower. Um, so we just want to pause for a moment to acknowledge that, and I'd like to go ahead and pray. So let's pray. God... We do, in the midst of this celebration, realize we live in a broken world, a world where oftentimes hatred and violence wins out over love and grace. But we know that in the end that um, your grace and your love and your truth wins. And so, uh, God, we ask that in this already but not yet space of where your kingdom has come but it's not fully realized, 
that God, you would be present with us and that you would help us to live as you have called and created us to and be with those people who suffer the consequence for a broken world. I pray for the families who are still grieving uh, the loss of their loved ones. I pray for uh, the firefighters and the first responders, the police, and their continued work, even those who are here today who put their lives on the line uh, consistently for other people. God, would you protect them and keep them safe? And God, as we just pause for a moment, um, we ask that you would restore, that you would heal, that you would redeem all the broken things that have happened. We know you will ultimately, but God, would you meet us here in this space? We pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Well, I'd like to begin by returning to the words of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 11. We started with them uh, nearly every week. And as we have before, I just want you to settle in and to listen to Jesus' invitation to you. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Well, it sounds good, doesn't it? What an invitation. Well, we're four weeks into our sermon series entitled Convivium. And if you haven't figured out what that word is yet, uh, you're going to learn about it today. I know many of you have probably Googled it like the first week, uh, but if you haven't, you're going to learn what that word is today. But before we get there, it's going to be helpful for us to begin or to actually go back to where we were a little bit earlier. And remember this? Yeah. So three weeks ago, we took a look at this and we had a choice between this which is 35 relational worlds that we are each navigating. And as I talked to many of you, you said, 35, that's nothing. I've got probably 60 that I'm trying to navigate. So here, I'll slide this a little bit so you can see it as well. There you go. Um, so we had to choose. Do we want this kind of crazy, or do we want these unforced rhythms of grace that Jesus invites us to? So number one or number two, right? <laughs> Which one, which one do we really want? And most of us all agreed that we long for the unforced rhythms of grace, don't we? That's what we were drawn to. And the way to this flourishing life offered to us by Jesus, this life in which we can experience the freely and lightly kind of living Jesus invites us to, is to remember that we live in a mimetic world. Now, a mimetic world simply means that this world has a certain purpose and order and meaning to it that's been established by God. And as we, as God's children, as we discover that uh, meaning and purpose and, and order through scripture and through creation, as we understand that and lean into it, the more we do that, the more we will experience the unforced rhythms of grace. And so the past two weeks, um, Eric and Kelsey have helped us look at kind of what is this world that God has created. And we spent some time in Genesis 1 to 3, which is the creation story, right? So we can discover the core things God has created us for. And we found two things. The first thing Eric brought us to is that we are created for community. In fact, we are created for community out of community, we are created to reflect the communal nature of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, three in one. We have a deep need inside of us, don't we? To be seen and to be known, to be welcomed, to be accepted, to be included in community. It's, it's part of how we're wired. 
And then last week, Kelsey helped us see that God also created us for a specific purpose, right? To expand God's good and just and loving ways. The kingdom of God, his grace, his truth, his mercy. And we're to do that in us and through us, which is why um, we as a church say that our vision is Christ in us and through us. It is to establish God's good and just loving ways in us as we surrender to the Holy Spirit and then allow God to use us as a conduit to move that into the rest of the world. So, we are called and created to live in Christ-centered community with a Christ-oriented purpose. We are called to live in a Christ-centered community with a Christ-oriented purpose. Unfortunately, what does this do? It's a barrier, right? It can get in the way of that happening because there are so many things that we need to do. Rather than experiencing the unforced rhythms of grace, so many of us feel like we are being tossed about on this wild sea of activity and movement, and we are longing to drop anchor somewhere so that we can steady ourselves in this crazy world. We're longing to find this little island of sanity that we can harbor ourselves at and find some kind of safety in the midst of our crazy lives. So this morning, I wanna suggest that a very practical and helpful anchor that we can drop, or a very practical and, and um, applicable uh, little island of sanity that we can create is the convivium. Now, a convivium is simply a shared meal together. A convivium is a banquet. The Latin word convivi with life. Um, the Italian uh, phrase, which re really is where this comes from, is this evening dinner meal that's a celebration and a banquet. That's what convivium means, a banquet, a shared meal around the table. So at risk of sounding overly simplistic, I believe that a shared meal around the table can be your little island of sanity. It can be the anchor that you drop that can find some stability in the midst of this kind of crazy, crazy, unsteady waters. I believe it can be a vital behavior. In the doctoral program that I help teach, there is a term we use often called vital behaviors, and they are the one or two or three behaviors that are clear and core down at the bottom, that if we do them, they tend to affect other things. They have ripple effects everywhere else. Well, I believe, and studies show us, as we'll see, um, I believe that the convivium may be one of those vital behaviors that will change so many other areas um, around us. Now, I realize... Um, that sounds like a lot to, to ask of a shared meal, right? Like this is gonna revolution our li revolutionize our lives or something. But there is something about the table that over time reflects the kingdom of God in a way that few other things can. I'm gonna say that again. There's something about gathering around the table over time. It's not gonna happen one time when you do it once. But over time, there's something about gathering at the table that reflects the kingdom of God in a powerful, powerful way. In fact, when scripture speaks of a future time where all things are gonna be made right in Revelation chapter 19 and Isaiah chapter five, do you know what it says we're gonna be at? A banquet with abundant food and drink and celebration and people gathered from every nation and tribe and tongue all gathered together in one place. So God's intended destination for his beloved children, or at least the image that he gives us to convey that place that he wants us to be, is a great banquet. It is a great convivium. And the table isn't just a picture of some far off future reality for us to hope for. Because we see in the life of Jesus that so many kingdom realities manifested when he was around the table. Just think about a few of them. Matthew chapter nine, 
when he calls Matthew the tax collector. And what happens afterwards? They have this giant party, and who shows up at the table? All those people, the tax collectors and sinners. So it was around the table that we see that even the unwanted are now wanted. That kingdom principle comes through. In Luke chapter 7, where the woman uh, anoints Jesus' feet and, and dries them with her tears and pours alabaster oil over them, we learn around the table there about forgiveness. In fact, not just for the woman, but we are um, modeled forgiveness so that the Pharisees could see what it really looked like to receive forgiveness. In John chapter 2, We all know about the great celebration at the wedding at Cana where they just got together for a big party to celebrate and Jesus turned the water into wine. In John chapter 21, we see that there's restoration for Peter. Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times. There's restoration for him as he who has failed miserably is welcomed back to the table. In John chapter 13, Humble service is modeled at the table as Jesus dons the basin and the towel and washes his disciples' feet and says, now you go and do likewise. In Mark chapter 14, we see that life, I mean actual life, is given at the table as Jesus breaks the bread and shares the cup of what is just about to come. Friends, in Jesus' own life and ministry, all of the great life-giving realities of the kingdom of God, they manifest themselves over and over again at the table. Things like welcoming and enfolding, forgiveness, inclusion, celebration, restoration, forgiveness, life, all of that unfold at the table. And the truth is, many of us have experienced that as well, right? How many of you have experienced that at the table, at the convivium? Maybe you didn't call it that, but you know what you experienced it when you did. I have experienced what it is to be welcomed and enfolded at another person's table, and it's beautiful. I have experienced deep conversations. I have experienced just hilarious laughter and then tears, and sometimes they're joined right next to each other, aren't they? I have watched as conflicts have been worked through at the table. I have experienced and offered forgiveness at the convivium. As I said, over time, there are few, if any, places that put flesh to the kingdom of God more than the convivium, the shared meal at the table. In fact, it's interesting a study done about 10 years ago by Cambridge University. They were looking at the one thing that would most benefit families, that would bring wellness, a sense of um, uh, well-being to them in health, in, in their spiritual lives, their emotional lives, everything, total health. It was to sit down around a table and share a meal five times a week. I want you to think about that. It wasn't more sports. It wasn't more church activities. It wasn't more vacations. It wasn't more money. It was five times a week around a table. Now I know what's going on in many of your minds. Five times a week with all of this going on? What are you, crazy, Ken? Yeah, I, I, like have you seen my schedule? Yeah. I have, and I, and I get it. So please understand, there is no guilt or shame here at all. I understand how difficult it is, but I just want to offer a possible way forward. So my encouragement to you as we go through this is to start where you can. Begin, if you are doing none, begin with one convivium per week. Just try it, if that's all you have space for, and trust that it will be that vital behavior that will begin to ripple out into other places in your life. My experience is that it acts like a beachhead. Remember when there was a a battle going on, they would establish a beachhead, a front, and then move out from there? Well, this is a battle that's going on. And 
the convivium is, is a place that we can establish a beachhead and then kind of go out from there. And lest you think this is only for nuclear families and it doesn't apply if you're single or if you're empty nesters or stuff like that, I want to tell you, just with minimal adjustments, this can apply to people in every stage and every age of life. It's applicable to everyone. And, and so um, what I want to do now is look at some guidelines because there are some guidelines to actually make this work in a way that's healthy, in a way that brings maximum amount of life to it. So in other words, you can't just say, well, we're just going to like, have a meal and you know, do a drive-by as you have the meal and that's going to do something. It actually takes a little bit of intention. So I'm going to give you six principles here that go on. And the first principle is this. Fast food must be exchanged for slow food. Okay, fast food must be exchanged for slow food. In other words, this sacred space that we're talking about requires some time, which means that other things are going to have to shift. Trying to shove a convivium into all of this activity, it usually isn't going to work if you're rushed. And so you're gonna have to make some decisions. But there's a method to the madness of why the convivium, why use this as an anchor? Because what do we all have to do? Eat. We all have to eat. And so this is a good place to kind of say, hey, let's use that as a starting point. It's, it's a good foundation upon which to build. But it's going to require some attention. So give yourself at least an hour. An hour and a half would even be better. You don't have to fill that whole time, but to give yourself some margin and some space to sit around a table and have a meal. And I realize, again, it's going to mean you're going to have to carve some space out, but you have to start somewhere, and again, I believe the convivium will give you the greatest return on your investment. So the first principle is we must exchange fast food for Slow food, fast food for slow food. The second principle for a meaningful convivium is that you have one table. One table. That means no TV and no TV trays. That means there is no kids table and no adult table. We all gather in one place at one time around one table. And I know that that is so countercultural in our radically individualistic culture. Um, Michelle and I just moved in to a new house, and it reflects that individualism. Because the dining room where you want to gather people, we have room for 10. Our master bathroom, we could have a party of 20 in our master bathroom. So think about this. The place that I want to be alone, we can have 20 people show up. The place where I want to have 20 people out, I got to squeeze them into it. In fact, last night we had about 20 people over with high school seniors and it bled out into the living room in order to make it happen. Yeah. So we must fight against this, cult, this, this individualistic pressure and not eat in our own place. We gather around one table. One table. So, fast food must become slow food. We must eat around how many tables? One table. And the third principle is to acknowledge that Jesus is present. And this is actually an important step to do because God is present everywhere, but sometimes we are not aware of that, and so we acknowledge it. Remember, Jesus himself said in Matthew 18 that where two or more are gathered in his name, that he is present with them as well. So when you gather around your table in a very beautiful way, listen to this, each house becomes a sanctuary. Think about that. Every dinner table becomes a sanctuary when you invite Jesus to it. So, pray. It's a great way to do it. Acknowledge that Jesus is present. Thank God for the provision that he has provided there. Ask God for the resources that you need to live your life and, and others that you know. 
and that you'd be able to be a representation of him sitting there around the table. Just invite Jesus to do that. So acknowledge Jesus. So our principles again, fast mood must become how many tables? One table. Acknowledge who is present. Jesus is present. And four, eat family style rather than buffet. I'm getting real pragmatic here. Eat family style rather than um, buffet. I know sometimes it's easier to go through the buffet line at the counter and then just go sit down and eat at the table. But what happens when you eat family style? You gotta interact with one another, right? You have to ask somebody to pass someone pass something. You have to serve someone else. Last night as we sat around the table, I have just this beautiful image of Jason Mast, who is one of the high school uh, small group leaders, sitting by this big bowl of pasta and everybody's handing him their plates and he's scooping out for them and passing her. What a beautiful image of the kingdom of God, isn't it? Like such a beautiful image. It allows us to interact with one another. It allows us to open some conversation. And when you eat buffet style, you know what normally happens? The first person through the buffet, they're done by the time the last person gets there and then they want to get up and go somewhere because they're done eating. So eat family style, not buffet. So our principles, fast food must become, okay. How many tables? Acknowledge who is there. And how should we eat? Family style and not buffet. And then the fifth principle is one conversation. One conversation. That means that this little thing here, it does not belong at the table. I want to tell you, parents, have your children put it away. You put it away. Because what does this thing do? It distracts people, and, I, and I'm guilty of this too. I, I've done it, so I'm preaching, to, I'm preaching to myself too here. But have you been at a restaurant before and watched that couple sitting right across from each other on the phone? They're not having community, and, and that's what happens. You are inviting people who aren't in the community to be in there. So, you know, I, I just wanna say, put it away. Um, in another couple of weeks, we are going to talk about technology and how that gets in the way of this and how we can use it in a good way and all that kind of stuff. Um, And we're gonna see that uh, face-to-face interaction with for our kids, it actually builds confidence. It teaches them how to listen. It teaches them how to have conversation as grown-ups, like it's a really helpful thing to do. So don't even bring the phones to the table. You will all survive, I promise. Another aspect of one conversation is to literally have one conversation, not five going on. Now please understand, sometimes it's great just to have the cacophony of people talking at the table and that's wonderful. But for at least for a few moments, I wanna encourage you to have one conversation. And the way that we did that in our family, really Michelle was the champion of this, she did high-low when we sat down at the table, which meant that every person had the floor for a few moments and then they would be able to share one high and one low that went on in their day. Both the adults and the children, everyone would go around the table and do that. And so many good things happen from this. So many good things happen. It provides a safe place to share the joys and the hard hard parts of life and your kids will know that they have a safe place to share and so will the adults. It also gives a sense of belonging as you are listened to. And parents, I want you to hear this clearly. I'm so glad this is happening on a dedication Sunday. If your children belong at the table, the chances of them finding uh, less uh, healthy places to belong goes way down. If your children and your family belong at the table, they're gonna be less likely to find unhealthy places to try to belong. And that's the truth is, that's, that goes for adults too. It also teaches the art of conversation, of speaking and listening. 
uh, when our kids were really little, uh, Rebecca, our daughter, was the talker, and Ben was a little bit more quiet in the process. And so we were doing high lows, and every time Ben would share something, Becca would have something to add to it. And so Michelle kind of was coaching, you know, conversation, and she said, um, Becca, um, uh, I want you to just only use one more sentence. Okay, just one more sentence, and then it's going to be Ben's turn. And Rebecca said, um, I was in the classroom, comma, and I went outside for recess, comma, and I, and I, and I. So, the sweet spaces around the table, friends. One conversation for a little while. And you get to know so much about the people who are there. I mean, do this with your guests. It's wonderful. You actually get to know somebody. And if you do this regularly over time, think of how much you know about one another just from that little space at the table. So, fast food must become how many tables? One table. Acknowledge who is present. How do we eat? You guys are great. How many conversations? And finally, our last principle is this. Have a festival of cleanup. <laughs> okay? Have a festival of cleanup. Okay? Because this is not the parent's job, it's not the wife's job, it's not the husband's job. Everybody gets to clean up. And you'll find that if that's the way you establish the precedent and you hold people to that, they'll fuss for about it for a while, but eventually the same conversation and stuff that was going on at the table will continue as you clean up. And even last night I was thinking about it. We had 20 people, high schoolers, talk about a mess of food, and we made the pasta by hand and the whole thing, and it only took us 15 minutes to clean up, 20 minutes to clean up, because everybody pitched in and they helped, right? So let's, let's do that. So those are the six principles. Now the one thing I haven't addressed is meal prep. And the reason that I haven't addressed it is because it is so different for every single person. And there are so many creative ways you can do it. Some of you have one of the spouses, or if you're both working, one's home earlier than the other, maybe they can start it. Um, some of you can do freezer meals. I know so many of you make stuff and put it in the freezer. They have these really cool things called crock pots or instapots that you can slowly cook things throughout the day. There are ways to make it happen. It does require a little bit of intention, and I will also encourage you, including your family in meal prep if they're around. It's a great way to do that. But um, like you're going to have to figure that one out. Now again, um, I want to remind you with a few adjustments, this will work with all people in all stages of life. If you're a family and you know a single person, I would encourage you to invite them over and do it more often. Make it a regular thing, and I'm guilty of this, of not doing this, and it's an orientation that my wife and I have been talking about. Like, how do we include someone more often? If you're single, invite some other people over. Not out five nights a week, but once or twice. And invite some people over and create that space. If you're empty nesters like Michelle and I are becoming, invite friends and neighbors over. Invite people that you don't know over. Like I said, last week we had 15 high school seniors, and in the past month, I just was kind of reflecting, we have had over 50 different people sitting around our dinner table. And it's just because it's the season we're in. We did not do that when we had littles, right? Not possible. But it is now. It can happen. Um, yeah. So please hear me clearly now so as I wrap up. I am not saying that this is the only way to make life slow down. And I'm not saying that if you don't do this, you are doomed to this kind of chaos for the rest of your life. All of you are gonna have to figure out your way to manage this crazy life in the way that works best for you. However, I am suggesting that the convivium may be a little island of sanity in your busy life. It may be a way for you to begin to drop an anchor and and allow it to hold you from getting tossed about by the storm. So start where you can. And here's the deal. If you don't have any sense of invitation or drawing to this, that's absolutely okay. Because I've preached hundreds of messages that have had no application before. Like, you just guys, eh, it doesn't matter, right? That's fine. This may be that one for you. But if there's something stirring in you, I want to invite you to consider how to engage it. 
We talk about OIC all the time here. Observation, invitation, cooperation. So if you're observing that your life feels like this, and you maybe want to make some changes, and you hear an invitation from God, hey, try this convivium thing out. Figure out how to cooperate with him and trust that good things will happen from that. Start small and build there. And last thing before we wrap up, if you want to spend the next 10 months exploring how this idea of a convivium can actually grow into hospitality and impact your family, your neighborhood, your community, even the whole world, I want to invite you to join us at the table. It's a 10-month-long cohort that begins today in SEB 124, right over there, um, from 3 to 6 p.m., and it's going to continue once a month uh, for the next 10 months during that time. And this afternoon is a come-and-see opportunity. In other words, you can just show up, be a part of it for three hours, and if you walk away and go, no, not something I'm going to be involved in, no commitment, if you want to, you can continue on with us for the next 10 months. Friends, here's the deal. All of us said we would rather choose this over this, right? We all said that this is what we want. And there are many ways to do that. But if you're uncertain about where you might start, I would challenge you to consider the convivium. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge we live in a crazy, busy world. And it's overwhelming sometimes. And so I pray that as we consider this, you would open our hearts to be curious. God, this isn't about you should or you shouldn't do it. But God, just allow us to be curious so that we can hear your Holy Spirit if the Spirit is inviting us into this type of a life. I ask that if there are those who are wrestling right now and feeling like, I don't know how this is gonna happen for me, that you would encourage them, that you would um, speak to them that in your grace, it's really possible. For those who this just stirs up a whole lot of longing because they have not felt like they belong, God, I ask that you would meet them and that we as a body would learn to do this well. I pray for the families here, those that have just been dedicated and all the other families. God, that you would give them clarity as to how you're inviting them into a more sustainable way of living. And then God, may all of us experience, whether it's at the table or another place, the reality of your kingdom coming and your will being done in us and through us on earth as it is in heaven. And God, we will give you the praise. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, if there's not enough going on today, it is Grandparents' Day. And so I think we have some ice cream outside, uh, and we're going to celebrate. I think it's Grandparents' Day. That is today. Yes? I don't see any of my staff. They're all... Yes, Kelsey, thank you very much. It's Grandparents' Day today, and we do have ice cream outside, uh, so we're going to be able to celebrate. Also, if you have come here prepared to give uh, your tithes and offerings, we don't pass the plate, but we do have some boxes at the exits that you are welcome to place your offerings in, or you can check that QR code, and uh, that'll give you all the information you can give. So would you stand with me and receive the parting blessing from God? So now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I want to encourage you to come back next week. We've got some guests on a panel, and we're going to talk about the childhood conundrum and how to include children in this process. So come on out next week.
Thank you.